Good. Well, hello, Greenspring. Today is October 7th, 2015. I'm Fran Duvall, your host for today, and I'm so happy to be back here with our, li our presidential library expert, because who else is going to be doing the expert? <laughs> no, because you really are an expert on presidential libraries, Len Cockworth. Thank you. Hello, Len. Glad to see you Thank wearing you. your tie again well, that has all the presidential presidents. Day. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, we, I, I meant to look up, Len. I think it's been either, I think it's been about five years we've been doing this show, mm -hmm. talking about the presidents. And after the libraries, there are only 13. That's right. So yeah. we, we went on and did, the, in sequence, uh, the presidents. That's right. We starting should. with Lincoln. Right. Yeah, we did Lincoln, but then we went uh, to Andrew Jackson. Oh, we went back. That's right, Andrew Jackson. And then we Jackson. did them all in sequence since then. Okay. Every one of them, right up until today's Herbert Hoover. Right. We did Calvin Coolidge yes. three Art. months ago. Yes, right. And now here we are on Herbert and Hoover. The, and there are many who would say that he was one of our worst presidents. And I hope that after today's show, people will realize that maybe he wasn't one of the worst presidents. In fact, maybe he was much better than many people think. You know, I've asked around uh, here at Greenspring about Herbert Hoover and what they know about him. <clears throat> yeah, because he was in office during the lifetime of numbers well, yeah, of our residents. Especially me. Including <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. um, and when I ask people about Herbert Hoover, th their response is something like this. Well, uh, he was the one, wasn't he, that uh, has a dam named after him? Or uh, he was uh, responsible for the Great Depression or he was president and didn't do anything during the Great Depression. And, and all of those may be true, but I'm not so sure, okay? Mm -hmm. um, he became president in March of 1929, and at that time, uh, this was right after Calvin Coolidge presidency, uh, the economy was robust, things were going well, these were the roaring 20s, mm -hmm. and when uh, Hoover took over, Things look very good, and he talked about the fact that this might be the end of poverty. Uh, we conquered all of that and so on. And the progression, progressives were very, very happy that Hoover was elected. Um, but it's an interesting. Uh, he was very, very popular. He uh, was, was elected in a landslide, and four years later he lost in a landslide to mm -hmm. uh, Roosevelt. To Franklin uh, Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah, because people just felt that his style, his management style, was not good. Mm -hmm. And I think in order to understand something about Hoover, we have to really understand, I guess that's true of all of us, his background and where he really came from. And that's what I'd like to talk about. And first of all, I'd like to mention that all of the pictures we're going to be showing uh, were taken at his library, and they were taken... In fact, last Friday we were there in Iowa at the library. We meaning My, your wife and you, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, so th these pictures are all from there. And the first picture we're going to show is the exterior of the library in Iowa. There we and are. And what city in Iowa is uh, this? West Branch, which is right outside of Iowa City. And Iowa City, of course, is the home of the University of Iowa. Okay. Okay? All right. So, um, now... Let me just mention a little bit about uh, Hoover as a man. Uh, his father was a blacksmith, and he had uh, his mother, by the way, was an ordained minister in the uh, Society of Friends, the Quakers, which mm -hmm. is, first of all, very unusual because there are very few ordained ministers in that denomination. And to think in terms of a woman being an ordained minister back there at mm -hmm. that time mm -hmm. is also very unusual. And I guess Hoover really rebelled against that because um, he, he didn't like the fact that he had to go to church every Sunday and uh, sitting through the what he felt uh, were dry sermons. Mm -hmm. um, so he did rebel in that respect. Also, the only thing that Hoover had at home to read was the Bible and very few books, an encyclopedia, that type of thing. Um, he was a little country boy, frankly, and one of the things he liked to do was to fish, and that became his lifelong sport. And we have a picture of him uh, from the library about him uh, being a fisherman. Mm -hmm. uh, can we show that? There he is. Uh, 
Now, he, he did a lifetime, and the thing that when he was president, he went fishing in Shenandoah Park, where he had uh, built a, uh, a cabin. Uh, that was his Camp David, really. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, it, it was there, it's no longer there, but it was there until right after his presidency. Um, FDR was not able to use it because of his handicap, mm -hmm. and so that went into a disrepair. Um, okay, uh, let's, let me move on a little bit. Um, in addition to his religion, the other thing that was a major factor in his growing up was a tragedy. Um, he had a brother and a sister, and his parents died at a very early age, so they were all orphans. Uh, by the time that the oldest one was 13, they were farmed out to uncles and aunts. And in the case of Herbert Hoover, he went to um, uh, the West Coast to Oregon uh, to be with an uncle. And he realized then how cruel people could be when he met his uncle. His uncle apparently was not a very uh, loving person. Uh, his uncle's son had uh, died just prior to that, so Herbert Hoover was kind of taking his place. But uh, <coughs> he was not treated very well. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't have much chance for education. And then later on, he went with another uncle who was a real estate man, and he worked in his office and taught himself how to type. Um, apparently, he taught himself mathematics, so he was very good at math, but the rest of his education was very limited. He was not able to write very well, couldn't read very well. But um, after, uh, after he grew up, he found out that Stanford University was opening in California the first, and he entered, or he applied to enter the first class. And his uh, background was really not adequate for him to go to college. However, there was um, a man on the faculty who took a liking to him because of his mathematical ability. And that man, by the way, later on became president of Swarthmore College, mm -hmm. a Quaker college. Mm -hmm. um, so he helped him along and uh, they accepted him, um, though apparently to his dying day he was not the best writer and they had to oftentimes uh, redo some of the writings that he uh, did. Mm -hmm. um, then he began to work, um, he, first of all he majored in uh, mining and he became a mining engineer, uh -huh. but he could not get a job right after he got out of college and so then he uh, got a job working uh, in, a, in a gold mine where he had to push carts uh, 10 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. I think he got like $10 a week to, to do this. A very, very uh, difficult job. But while he was in college, the other thing that he did, he went to the Ozarks with one of his professors and mapped out the uh, topography of the Ozarks, which was a rattlesnake infested uh, area. And the map apparently was uh, displayed at, uh, in the Chicago, I don't know, it was not a World's Fair, but some exhibition there, uh, <coughs> which kind of made a name for him. But somewhere along the line uh, at that point, even though he was having a very difficult time and he understood what it meant to be poor, he met a man who uh, had some contact with a British mining in a company. And the British Mining Company said to this particular man that they wanted a young uh, man who was a, had majored in mining engineering, who was at least 35 years of age, to go to Australia. Well, Hoover was, uh, I think, about 22, 24 years old. I was going to say, how old was he then? Yeah. <laughs> so he passed himself off as being 35 <laughs> and got the job and went to Australia and there worked for... Uh, two years for this British mining company. And again, uh, the conditions were terrible under which he had to work. Um, sometimes the temperature at nighttime did not drop below 100 degrees. Um, the biography that I just read recently about him said that Hoover was a very hard taskmaster. Uh, nobody liked him. Um, he fired people at will. Uh, he was not very social conscious. Um, he didn't talk to people. Um, he had no sense of humor. How in the world did this man end up president? Well, <laughs> it, it, 
I'll tell you why. <laughs> well, you'll find out right away. Um, but it's not because of his personality. Uh, that's for sure, but because of his ability. But while he was there in Australia, he discovered a very rich gold mine uh, for the British company that he was working for. And as a result, um, I forget what he, how much money he got, but uh, probably close to a million dollars or something like that. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that he got a 20% uh, stake in this particular company. Mm -hmm. So. His goal was to become a millionaire by the age of 40, which he made very easily. Um, after uh, the two years in Australia, having all this money, uh, he then got an invitation to go to China to be in charge of the mines in China. But before he went to China, he now cabled uh, a girl by the name of Lou Henry, who was also, also had been a maj majoring in mining engineering at Stanford, although she was three years behind him, um, and proposed, and they got married, and they celebrated their honeymoon on their trip to China. So, now, living in China um, was not quite what he had anticipated, because shortly after he arrived in China, the Boxer Revolution took place, and the Boxer Revolution um, they were anti-American, anti-imperialist, uh, anti-Christian. Um, the boxers uh, massacred a large number of people, including a large number of Christians. So uh, they were kind of uh, prisoners in their compound. But um, while, while he was prisoner in the compound, Lou Henry um, worked as like a nurse and um, Hoover established barricades and so on, but after about a month, uh, the, uh, the thing ended, and so they were free. Uh, I, I, I ought to go back to another picture here about uh, Hoover. I, I, I should have said that before, but uh, there's a picture here as a mining engineering. Can we see it? There he is. <laughs> All right. Was he smoking a pipe? Yeah, he's that, smoking it, it a pipe. It looked like a corn uh, cob pipe. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, now, two years after they were in China, they went, he went back to London. By that time, he had accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. And uh, while they were in London, um, he was then 27 years of age, I think. And uh, he wrote a textbook, uh, Principles of Mining. And then he and his wife uh, spent the next five years translating <laughs> from Latin, a, uh, I think it was a 16th century classic work on mining. So wow. they were very much interested, obviously, in the, in the mining. But now, going back to the fact that here he was in London, and World War I breaks out. And there were uh, hundreds of American uh, citizens in Europe who could not get back to the United States. And he was the one who organized and made it possible for the people to get back to the United States. And that was really the turning point for him. Um, he now no longer, by the way, before this, uh, he had been the regarded as the doctor of sick minds. He had uh, had a, a large business worldwide in which they would go to uh, uh, mines. That he would be asked to go to mines that were not producing, and he would turn the mines around, for which, of course, he got a certain percentage. And uh, <coughs> unfortunately, he referred to some of these people as being stupid. And it kind of comes back to me some of the words that I hear now in the campaign. But Hello. <laughs> that was his, uh, his comment. Um, but as a result of this, I, I don't know how many thousands of uh, employees he had worldwide. Um, very lucrative business, obviously. But now, being in Europe, and helping the Americans getting back to the United States during World War I, um, that was the turning point for him. He no longer was a businessman after that. Um, and he had so much money that he said that he didn't want to make any more money. That was no longer what he, his goal in life. Uh, he was a multi-millionaire by that time. Um, and from that day on, he never took any salary for any of his public work including later on when he was president. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to, obviously, but he, he didn't yeah. either. Um, well, he, did he, was he viewed as a hero 
uh, when he got arranged all these Americans to get back to... Oh, to, yeah, the people were Did it get so, press? Uh, yeah, the, the, the press pe coverage? people were so grateful for what he was doing, not just the Americans, but the Europeans, because mm -hmm. he was now also uh, helping as far as Europe was concerned. And I want to show another picture here. Um, uh, this is a map of the uh, children's uh, fund that he was... Um, and where he helped in Europe, these, these countries, for example. Mm-hmm. And that was during the war, the first This World is during World War I. Yeah. And uh, immediately after the war as well. Now, we'll so show another picture here about the, uh, he was in charge of the Release, uh, Relief Council and to make sure that food would be distributed to the hungry people in Europe. And um, one of his comments was that uh, he would help anybody who was starving and that when the war was over, he said he would also make sure that the Germans who were starving <coughs> would also get food. And Henry Cabot Lodge was so appalled by this, but even before the war was over, he was already sending food uh, to the Germans. Mm -hmm. So, okay, and then there's another picture that we want to show. This has to do with <coughs> the Belgian lease. Uh, apparently... I've seen uh, lace like that. <laughs> you, you Over there, the, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, Bev is standing there looking at the display. And that's your uh, wife, Bev, yeah. Yeah. Now, the Belgium lease apparently was worldwide, uh, known worldwide. It goes back to uh, the 16th century. And they stood in uh, the possibility of actually being devastated and destroyed because of the war. But he made certain that uh, their product was being sold in both the United States and in Great Britain, and all the proceeds went back to the women uh, in Belgium, mm -hmm. and actually that saved <coughs> the industry. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's go for another picture here. All right, uh, food will help win the war. Well, he was appointed by uh, President Wilson to be the food czar, really. Um, and by the way, one of the things that comes out very clearly is that he was the type of personality that he wanted to be completely in control. Mm -hmm. And only if he was completely in charge, which he was in this case. <coughs> and uh, as a food star, he, um, he talked about uh, the clean plate. People should eat less. They should eat everything on their plate. I guess that's where we get some of this, um, you know, uh, the parents would say, you know, uh, eat everything. You think of the poor kids starving. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. I have a feeling it comes from that. But in any event, um, meatless days, uh, breadless days, uh, smaller portions, and his name appeared on the menu in every restaurant across the country hmm. because of being the food czar. Mm -hmm. And it was said because of that and because of what he was, what he was doing, he was the second best known man in the United States, next, <laughs> next to President Wilson. Next to the Wil and the yeah. Wilson. <laughs> so, which, of course, later on made a big difference when it, the time came for election. Um, now, Hoover supported the idea of the League of Nations, um, which, of course, was Wilson's uh, idea. <clears throat> uh, but he also said to what Wilson, uh, even though the treaty is not completely to your liking, accept it and then you can get all of this through and of course Wilson wouldn't do that and as a result we never got into the League of Nations. Um, now in 1928 um, he was uh, talked about, 1920 already, he was talked about of being a, a candidate for president. Um, he was so popular and they didn't know whether he would be a Republican or a Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, there were those, however, who said that he <laughs> wasn't eligible to be president because he had uh, been a resident of the United States for the f previous 14 years, which is one of the requirements of the Constitution. Um, <laughs> others said that there was question whether or not he was a U.S. citizen because they said, some said he was on the tax rolls and had voted in Great Britain. So. But in any event, apparently they worked all of that out. But they didn't uh, really know whether he was going to be Republican or Democrat. But then when Harding became president in a landslide, uh, he said he was going to get the best people he could in his cabinet. 
And one of those that he was choosing was Herbert Hoover. Well, the businessmen in um, Pennsylvania, especially in the Pittsburgh area, were all up in arms about that because Hoover was too progressive, <laughs> too liberal. The right wing of the party did not want him. Mm -hmm. But Harding said, either you ch allow him to be in my cabinet, and if you don't, I will not approve Mellon as the Secretary of Treasury, mm -hmm. who came, comes, of course, from Pittsburgh. Well, Harding won out, and he offered <coughs> the position of either Secretary of Interior or the Secretary of Commerce to Hoover, and Hoover chose Commerce. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting, uh, Hoover's personality was such that he had not a single friend in the cabinet, uh, after a few years especially. <coughs> they said that he was Secretary of Commerce, but he was the undersecretary of all of the others because he just commandeered uh, things from the other cabinets mm -hmm. for himself. Mm -hmm. And he just grabbed those responsibilities. Um, he was building an empire. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have some uh, picture here, I think, of <coughs> him as the Secretary of Commerce. Well, isn't that one? Yeah. And we have another one. Uh, now let's go to the next we're, one. We're going backwards. Yeah, there we are. Okay. He's talking on the telephone. He's the first president, by the way, who had a telephone on his desk. All right, and there's one more I think that I'd like to show at this point. Okay, uh, I recognize that, uh, and Looks he, like a many of you machine. do too, I'm sure. This is a Maytag washing machine washer, yeah. with the old ringer on top. Right, right. Yeah. But why does that have to do with him? This is what that day was like when he was president. <laughs> this kind of shows this, the social setting of the day. And that's I why see. it's it's it, there. That's in the part of his museum exhibit. Yeah. That's okay. One of the, uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Um, he he reorganized the Department of Commerce. <clears throat> he established uh, regulations. Um, he helped reduce the work uh, day from uh, twelve hours to eight hours. Uh, he, he did a great deal about flood control. And by the way, uh, in 1927, in 1927, uh, there was a, a major flood in the lower part of the Mississippi. Um, they said it was, you know, when Karina, Karina took place, the hurricane, they said that this was uh, the, the biggest natural disaster since the Mississippi flood. You mean Katrina? Yeah, you left right. The yeah, okay. And yeah. Uh, many of the governors asked <laughs> that Herbert Hoover be uh, in charge of uh, uh, building dams and so on mm -hmm. to take care of that uh, flood and do, do flood control. And of course, after that, uh, he also went to the southwest and the Hoover Dam was built, and that was under his mm -hmm. uh, responsibility as well. Um, he, he, he was one, in, it's interesting, he was a Republican, but he was very much in favor of regulation, uh, very important. Now, for example, the question was asked, what, what are the dimensions of a one-inch board? And there were 32 different answers to that. And he <laughs> insisted that there be a regulation and that anybody a standard a standard uh, yeah, yeah. yeah and if anybody was going to uh, bid on some government contract mm -hmm. they had to abide by the standard that had been established and so that everybody could read it and know what we're that's talking right about. yeah and he was the one who insisted on that you mm -hmm. see so um, he did the same thing in terms of uh, <coughs> uh, airways um, this is the beginning of the radio um, and by the beginning of the television pretty soon but he said that the airwaves belong to the public, and we can thank him for that, that it's, that's still true. All right. Yeah, Let me see we what have else. about three minutes left. Okay. Oh, we'll never make it. <laughs> we'll never get through it all. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, okay. Then as far as his election was concerned, his election took place in uh, 1928, uh, and... Uh, he was nominated in the first ballot of the Republican Party, um, even though there were those who said that, uh, there were those who were absolutely opposed to him, but he still uh, was nominated in the first ballot. And his vice presidential candidate was Curtis from Kansas, 
who happened to be a, North, a Native American. It shows a little bit in terms of his feeling regarding social <laughs> issues. Um, he was elected by, in a landslide, of course. Now, unfortunately, um, seven months after he was elected, the Great Depression took place. And while there are those who would want to blame Hoover for being the responsible party, um, obviously it was not. There are a, a number of causes for the uh, um, Depression, certainly. One was that the Feds cut the uh, money supply, and Hoover f felt that it was very important to keep <coughs> wages up because then people would have money to spend and it would, you know, circulate. Sure. And uh, he, he got uh, many employers who uh, promised to that. In fact, Henry Ford even said that he would raise wages at that particular time. Um, and then, of course, another thing was that there was the uh, Smoot Tariff Act that uh, um, cut out the um, cheap imports from foreign countries, and that kind of backfired. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lack of bank regulations, and so many of the small <coughs> banks would uh, uh, speculate with their depositors' in, uh, money, uh, put in the stock market, and when the stock market crashed, the banks, of course, closed. Um, now, we only have a couple minutes left, so I'm going we to go... We have about one minute left. All right. Okay. Let me just say um, something about um, uh, things that I think people probably don't uh, realize about him. Um, some of the positive things that Hoover did was he uh, launched a public works program. He asked for and received from Congress a substantial reduction in income tax. He uh, summoned industrialists to the White House to maintain salaries, as I mentioned. He got utility companies to uh, do a tremendous amount of investing, of building, uh, spending, expanding. Uh, in 1932, he pushed through uh, Congress the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the RFC, which uh, President Roosevelt continued uh, later on. And uh, the corporation made loans to banks and railroads and agriculture, um, which and he was criticized for that uh, later on because it, it seemed as if he was doing everything for so-called Wall Street and not for the common man. Um, I have one other thing that I really wanted to say, um, which of course now I can't find it immediately. Well, one thing, some of the programs you mentioned were things that Roosevelt did. Uh, right. Well, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to get oh, to. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, a man by the name of Tugwell, who was an agricultural <laughs> economist and who was part of uh, FDR's brain trust, he said, uh, he later wrote, although no one would say so at the time, that practically the whole New Deal was taken from programs that Herbert Hoover had started. And I thought that's a very interesting comment that it, somebody who was w inside the circle recognized that Herbert Hoover had started these. So in spite of the fact that what people may say about Herbert Hoover and that he did nothing, he did a lot, you see. Well, it's, I, I wished we could have covered every single page <laughs> of your uh, report today. But thank you, Len. It's, uh, surely the people who live here now have a whole different picture. <laughs>